We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, and we are here together at the Four Lakes Congregation in Madison, the capital city of Wisconsin, enjoying another chilly day today. So very cold and windy out there, and I am recording this on Wednesday morning after everybody's out of the house, so it's a little more quiet in here. But I'm looking forward to looking at this chapter. Glad you're here with us tonight. We'll be looking at the first half of Acts chapter 28 tonight. So I would invite you to be turning in your Bible to Acts chapter 28, and we'll be covering, I think, the first 15 verses of this chapter. So I hope to meet you there in just a few minutes, and I hope to see you this coming Sunday for worship, either at 9 or 11. Use the Sign Up Genius account if you're able to do that. We do appreciate that. And then also everybody's invited to join us for the Bible class at 10 o'clock as we continue looking at the exploits of King David. So hope to see you this Sunday at 9 or 11 and then also in between those two services for a Bible class, Bible study at 10 a.m. Tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts. So this is the book of gospel actions, some of the acts of some of the apostles. We've been in this for a number of months now. We are now in the last chapter. This book is written to a man by the name of Theophilus. Uh, which means a friend or lover of God, which would certainly be appropriate for hopefully any of us here uh, gathered listening to this class or watching this class tonight. Hopefully that would describe us. But it is written by Luke, who is described by Paul as being the beloved physician. So Luke is writing to Theophilus. He writes the book of Luke, introducing this man to Jesus. And now he is writing the book of Acts, introducing this man, Theophilus, to the beginning of the church and the history of the early church. So I've uh, enjoyed this study, and I'd be a little bit, bit sad to leave it next week. So uh, we do plan on wrapping up the book of Acts next Wednesday, if the Lord wills. By way of very brief review, we've been using the ABCs of Acts. So I know this is uh, something hopefully that is familiar to us now. Hopefully you're not too tired of this. I know we repeat this every week, but uh, we've been using a successive letter of the alphabet for each chapter, and then we're back to A and B again for the last two chapters since we have 28 chapters. So in chapter one, we had the ascension, then the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, a reference to Stephen and the sermon he preached, how can I? I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionary sent out, not gods but men. The old law is not binding, Philippian jailer converted, questions answered in Athens, reasoning with a preacher, saving our religious friends, Troas on the Lord's Day, uproar in Jerusalem, valuable citizenship, waiting to kill Paul, excuses of Felix yet untried by Caesar, zealous toward God, arriving safely on shore. And tonight in the last chapter, we come to being with Christians in Rome. So back to B for the second time, uh, being with Christians in Rome. Last week, we had Paul in the ship as it was breaking up in the storm as the ship got stuck on the shore with the waves destroying it from the rear. There are 276 souls on board as Luke describes it for us. And in the very last verse of Acts chapter 27, they come ashore holding on to planks and other debris from that ship. And that brings us to Acts chapter 28, where they discover that they have been shipwrecked on the Mediterranean island of Malta. So they are now coming ashore on Malta. This is where we pick up tonight with Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. So Acts 28, 1 through 6. When they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw that the saw the creature hanging from his hand they began saying to one another undoubtedly this man is a murderer and though he has been saved from the sea justice has not allowed him to live however he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm but they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead but after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Last week, I referred to a short video 
uh, just under six minutes, I think five and a half minutes or so, with some news from the Malta Summit, if you remember that. I hope you were able to watch that last week, but that was the summit uh, between the first President Bush and uh, Russian President Mikhail Gorbachev back in December 1989. I think I was a, a senior in high school. That was the first semester of my senior year back in the fall of 1989, just a few weeks left before graduating and heading down to Fried Hardeman. But I remember the waves on the news. I just remember catching a glimpse of that in the evening news. You know, people way back in the olden days used to watch the evening news, like I think 5.30 or whatever on the networks. And I don't think that's really much of a thing these days anymore. But I remember seeing the, the waves and some kind of Navy ship just bobbing, bobbing up and down in those waves off of Malta. And it was known as the Seasick Summit, the Seasick Summit, because of the conditions of the Mediterranean Sea. And I hope you had a chance to watch that video. Uh, if not, I'll try to post a link again to the YouTube description, maybe uh, put it there as well as in the Facebook post as well, just in case you didn't have a chance to watch that last week. But this is where Paul landed. And I just think it's interesting that we have actual video of a storm and some of our very modern ships actually struggling quite a bit with the waves off of Malta. So they shipwrecked on the island of Malta, which is just south of Italy, uh, right there in the Mediterranean Sea. In verse 2, Luke says that when they landed, the natives of the island showed them extraordinary kindness. So we learn here it was cold, it was raining. They built a fire, they welcomed this group, and uh, this rather large group is uh, suddenly coming to land on this very remote island with no notice. And personally, I kind of have this picture in my mind of Paul and these 276 souls coming on shore here. And I think back to the people of Halifax, Nova Scotia, when the planes started diverting up there on 9-11. I don't know if you remember that. It wasn't well known at the time, but I think more and more was revealed and uh, very quickly, I think after 9-11, we started learning about that. But the plane started landing, diverting to Nova Scotia on 9-11. And as I remember it, they took in 40 planes and more than 8,000 people at this rather small airport up in Nova Scotia. But the, if you remember the news reports from back then, the townspeople brought food and welcomed them into their homes. And that just comes to mind here as the people of this island, they're just minding their own business on this winter day and it's cold and it's raining and all this and uh, this huge ship disintegrates on one of their beaches so they kindle a fire they welcome them in as best as they can notice in verse 3 though we have some drama uh, as Paul is gathering firewood as he's putting this wood onto the fire uh, this snake doesn't really appreciate being uh, <laughs> picked up in this bundle of firewood or whatever and uh, jumps out and fastens itself on Paul's hand and Luke describes this as a viper, so it is venomous. Uh, in fact, this is apparently familiar to the locals. They know what happens in these situations, so they assume that this is justice, that Paul is guilty of murder, and uh, that although he's been saved from the sea, justice is not allowing him to live. And I just find it interesting how fickle people can be. And going from one extreme to the other here is just something that I find interesting. So snake bite suddenly, ooh, this guy must have uh, deserved what he got. That's a very normal human reaction, I think, to jump to a conclusion like this. They had no idea who they were dealing with, with one of uh, God's apostles. But I'm guessing it's very dramatic. We have a shipwreck, numerous prisoners, and the locals have to be somewhat nervous from the very beginning. Oh, look, a shipwreck. Let's go help these people. Ooh, some of them are in chains. <laughs> This may not be quite as uh, good as we think it might be in terms of us being able to help them. But they jump to the conclusion that justice has been served. So God had a plan for the snake to bite this man or, or something like that. Uh, however, Paul immediately shakes the snake off into the fire and now they wait. And they fully expect Paul to swell up and die, but it never happens. Uh, several years ago, as I was preparing to do some hiking in the Smoky Mountains, I listened to a podcast for backpackers where a man was bitten by a rattlesnake out in the wilderness down there and almost died. It was just a terrible, terrible experience. It was absolutely terrifying to listen to what this man was going through as he was bitten by a rattlesnake and he was out there on his own. Nobody knew where he was. He was trying to make his way back to civilization to get some treatment for that and all that. But just a, a terrifying uh, situation. Almost uh, almost died there. Thankfully, he survived, but just barely. And I learned in that 
that anti-venom is almost never covered by health insurance. I, I didn't really know that. Uh, now I'm extra scared of hiking in the South, but uh, the care is covered. They will take care of you. Uh, but often the anti-venom itself is not. And so they will send you the bill, the full price for that. And the anti-venom can range from fifty dollars to $75,000 or even more, assuming that it's even available. So that was a learning experience for me. Uh, but instead of dying this painful death, however, Paul lives. They wait a long time. Nothing unusual happens, so they change their minds about justice. And now they flip-flop to the other side, and they start thinking that maybe Paul is a god. Uh, you may remember that this kind of thing has actually happened at least once before. Remember back, uh, not gods, but men? In Acts chapter 14, in Lystra, because of the healing that they were doing, people thought that Paul and Barnabas were the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes, and that gave them an opportunity to teach and explain. And that, of course, is about to happen again. I think it's in the last part of the book of Mark, that little paragraph that's kind of in doubt is in terms of the text itself. There's a lot of discussion on that, where uh, if they'll be bitten by poisonous or uh, venomous snakes, rather, they won't be, uh, won't be injured. And so this is, I think, one example of this actually uh, coming to fruition. This is one case where we have a, a gospel preacher bitten by a venomous snake, and he actually survives this, and he uses it to the advantage of the gospel. So he's about to use this opportunity to teach and explain who Jesus really is. So that's what's about to happen here. Let's move on to the next paragraph then, and let's continue with Acts 28, verses 7 through 10. Acts 28, 7 through 10. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect, and when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. Well, now that they know Paul is not deserving of death, again, they flip-flop to the other side here now, and Paul is now uh, welcomed by a leading man of the island, a very uh, influential landowner, a man by the name of Publius. Again, he's a landowner. He uses his resources to welcome and to entertain Paul and his companions for the next three days. As Paul is staying with this man, enjoying his hospitality, this man's father gets sick with fever and dysentery. So uh, Paul then visits the man, he prays, he lays his hands on the man, and he is healed. In verse 9, we find that this is the first of many healings. Word gets around. Everybody else on the island starts coming to Paul for healing. I guess I look at this paragraph, and I kind of find it interesting that they are coming to Paul, not to Luke, who is a medical doctor. <laughs> kind of funny in a way. I mean, it, we understand that. But uh, Luke is a doctor. They're not coming to Luke to get healed. Uh, they're coming to Paul. Paul is the apostle. He is the one who's using this miraculous power. And uh, these healings, they are instantaneous. They are miraculous. This isn't a case of uh, take this herb and, you know, daily for three days, get plenty of liquids and check in. That, you know, nothing like that. This is instantaneous, miraculous healing. But because Luke is with Paul, they are honoring Luke as well. Notice there in verse 10, they also honored us with many marks of respect. So here they go from being murderers, at least Paul thought to be a murderer because of the snake bite. Uh, now they are being honored with many marks of respect. In addition to this, they also supply them with everything they need uh, as they are preparing to set sail. So as they get ready for their time on this island to come to an end, they, uh, they send them off in a big way. So let's continue then with Acts 28 verses 11 through 15. Acts 28 11 through 15. At the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship which had wintered at the island and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. After we put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we sailed around and arrived at Rigium. And a day later, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Petuli. There we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and thus we came to Rome. 
And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Appius and three inns to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Well, obviously their ship has been destroyed, so they can't get out on the same ship they came in on. So after a period of three months, they get on an Alexandrian ship that had wintered on the island. So again, they had wintered there. They didn't crash there like Paul's ship did, but they were wise, got off the sea before it got too rough. And Luke points out that the ship had the twin brothers for its figurehead. So just kind of an interesting uh, comment here. I don't know if this was a famous ship, maybe something that Theophilus would have known about. But for some reason, Luke points out the particular ship that they were on. Uh, we do have a number of place names here. So we're switching over to a map again here. We've got the from Malta. They head north to Syracuse. That would be on the eastern shore of the island of Sicily. They're in Syracuse for three days before heading to Regium, right on the kind of the, the toe of the Italian boot. A day later, a southern wind springs up, so they continue on north to Petuli, and in Petuli they find some brethren. And I think we're, we're familiar now that Paul's custom is to find brethren wherever he travels, and this is no exception. And I'm still impressed that the centurion, Julian, continues to allow this. But I guess at this point, we need to remember Paul has saved their lives, hasn't he? And so Paul is this honored hero on the island for, for uh, healing everybody. So I think the centurion is getting uh, a, a much deeper appreciation for Paul and for who he is. So Paul is not a, a flight risk. Uh, he has asked for this opportunity to appeal to Caesar. He's not like under arrest, you're in trouble, you're going to Rome kind of thing, really the opposite of that. And on top of that, Paul, he's not, he's not acting like somebody who's guilty of anything. Um, he's not on the run. There are many opportunities where he could have escaped but didn't. So they stay in Petuli for seven days, then they make their way on up to Rome. Uh, once they are in Rome, as I understand this, Christians from the market of Appius and from the three inns come to meet them. Uh, with the reference to the market of Appius, I'm assuming this is along the Appian Way. Uh, that's a Roman road connecting Rome to the south and then over to southeast Italy. So Paul then thanks God. He takes courage from you know getting to know these brethren. And this is our summary for this chapter, being with Christians in Rome. So Paul has finally made it to the city of Rome as he intended to do. As far as the text itself is concerned, this is a, a good place for us to pause for tonight. But I want to make a few more comments about the Appian Way itself. Since this is almost certainly the road that was used by Paul on his way into Rome from the south. So, kind of some uh, historical significance here. Um, our family, as many of you know, uh, had the opportunity to walk along the Appian Way for several miles. Uh, unintentionally, I think we would say, uh, back on January 2nd, 2008. Uh, my wife's sister lived in Germany at the time. Her husband was in the Air Force, and so we traveled to Germany for two weeks over the winter break in uh, 2007 to 2008, so kind of a week on each side of the New Year uh, celebration there. In the months leading up to our trip, we realized that we may be able to fly down to Rome uh, very economically. Of course, Germany is a lot closer to Rome than Madison is. And so we started checking on flights, and we found some flights with Ryanair. Ryanair is a budget airline based out of Ireland. And when I say budget airline, I mean the planes are literally held together with duct tape. We got on the plane, and there was duct tape appearing to hold pieces of the plane on. This is on the outside of the plane. We get on the inside of the plane. There is duct tape holding stuff together there as well. Maybe not the most wise decision that we've ever made, uh, but they did have a great deal on these uh, air, airplane tickets. So again, based in Ireland, uh, they made the news a few years ago uh, for having some, you know, pinup type calendar of their uh, flight attendants. And, you know, looking back on it, I'm like, yep, I can see this is the kind of airline we were flying. We had no idea at the time, but we quickly got an education on Ryanair. So it was an interesting experience to say the least. And we found round-trip tickets from Frankfurt, Germany, down to Rome for about 26 euro a piece. So a, a very good deal. So, so after celebrating New Year's in Germany, we flew from Frankfurt to Rome. We got to Rome at, I, it was 5 or 6 in the morning, way too early. But we wanted to take advantage of the short time that we had and get two full days down there. 
Um, so we, we got there to the Rome airport, maybe six in the morning or so. We take a taxi from the airport to the catacombs of St. Sebastian. And I think that was the first thing in all of Rome to open in the morning. So I don't know if they opened at eight or nine in the morning. We got there. And so we, we enjoyed looking through the catacombs and, and so on. And this is roughly three miles southeast of the old, old Rome, the headquarters of the Roman Empire and all those ruins and the Colosseum and all that kind of thing. So we toured the catacombs as soon as they opened that morning, whenever that was. And we were pretty much the only ones there, as I remember. We almost had the place to ourselves. And we were, I mean, it was January 2nd. Nobody apparently does anything on the new year like that in Rome. But when we came out of the catacombs, um, right on the old Appian Way, we realized that we didn't speak Italian. We had no cell phone that worked in Italy. Um, buses were not running on a regular schedule on the holiday. And where we really wanted to go was just over three miles that way. <laughs> and so what do we do? We're kind of out here on this old road in the middle of nowhere just south of Rome and and so we set out walking along the Appian Way we really didn't have much choice about that we'd seen everything we needed to see at the catacombs so two adults along with an eight-year-old and I think a ten-year-old at the time and uh, daughter had just turned eight I think on the plane on the on the way over from uh, from the US to uh, to Germany and uh, and we stuck out like sore thumbs over there. All of us had these crazy bright Columbia ski type jackets on. You see, we got orange and yellow and that bright whatever color it is. And I'm serious. Everybody else in Rome, I think, was wearing black, black, maybe brown. You know, the really wild liberal types maybe were wearing brown but i mean most almost everybody was wearing a like a black coat black hat that kind of thing and then there was us <laughs> and our super bright columbia coat so uh, uh not only that but uh, we were absolutely huge and in, in terms of huge i mean looking down on people you know how king saul was head and shoulders above the rest that was me in italy i was like a foot taller than the tallest person over there and so we just stuck out with the bright coats and the uh, amazing height advantage so this is our family right across the street from the catacombs of saint sebastian and I don't know whether you can see this on your screen at home. I know obviously you can't if you're listening on the phone, but there's a monument behind Keola that says Via Appia on it. And so this is some kind of marker along the Appian Way. And the Appian Way is that brick road with the cars on it. So we had just kind of crossed over the Appian Way to get to that monument to get a picture before we headed out of there. Uh, after leaving the catacombs, we quickly found ourselves on something that looked like a like a cut through. It was like the ancient, ancient Appian Way, kind of where the cars weren't going. So we kind of went there and we walked and we walked and we walked. And then we found ourselves in uh, like in the middle of an olive grove. Those are olive trees there in the background and then through a pasture. So complete with sheep. <laughs> we were walking through sheep and these olive trees. And so we walked and we walked and walked some more. Then we got to a gate. So the road hit just this gate unfortunately we were now on the inside of the gate looking out so now we're stuck and we've been walking a mile or two on what we thought was the shortcut and now we're stuck behind a gate and we really didn't want to turn and backtrack and all that remember we got two uh, kind of little kids with us here and I didn't really want to go to jail I had a good idea we were now trespassing at this point but I think we kind of waited there until somebody happened to come by who unlocked that gate and came through and we just kind of went through when it uh, opened for then and then we walked some more so we're now heading northwest on the Appian Way toward Palatine Hill and the Colosseum and I think this picture here does a pretty good job showing the bricks on the road doesn't look like it here but this is an active road so there are cars bicycles runners you know cars coming right up behind us here and we were between that white line and the stone or brick walls the rest of the way. So we were kind of squeezed right between the walls and traffic. Uh, this is also just another angle kind of showing the narrow little strip that we had to walk on. Looks like a bicycle uh, coming up on us in this picture. And uh, I think this kind of qualifies as a traffic jam on the Appian Way. Uh, we could reach out and we could touch cars on one side and the stone walls on the other side. And in this picture, it's a little bit washed out because of the, the contrast here, but you can just barely see what I think is one of the ancient walls around the old city of Rome up in the distance. So 
It almost looked like some kind of a, a castle wall. You could see that from a ways off, so we were getting closer and closer to that, kind of knew that we were heading somewhere important. And I think this might have been once we got inside the old city walls, uh, the traffic died down quite a bit once we got inside there, and we did feel just a bit safer without the cars speeding by uh, just inches away from us and the kids. And then this is a street sign along the way, uh, Via Appia Antica. I'm assuming this refers to the antique or the old, the original Appian Way, which, which it was. And again, this is the road that Paul would have taken as he made his way into Rome from the south. I looked it up again. The Appian Way was built in 312 BC. And I didn't really think I realized that before, but this was an old road when Paul traveled on it. I don't know if we have any 300 year old roads in our country right now. And so it, it was the old Appian Way when Paul came into town, but uh, obviously now it's, it's still being used for car traffic. Uh, the first day of our trip, we spent looking at the old sites um, on and around Palatine Hill. So that'd be the old headquarters of the Roman Empire. Uh, the next day we spent at the Vatican. Uh, but since that first day was a Wednesday, January 2nd, 2008, we made plans to worship with the Lord's Church in Rome that night. And this is where they meet in a storefront. It is narrow, kind of right inside the door. They put little folding, I would call those kind of TV trays, little tables outside with tracks on them when they're open, kind of welcoming people in. And it's narrow right there, like a little uh, narrow corridor with some tracks and books in there cubby holes like we would say uh, today at our church building but then it, you go back and it kind of opens up a little bit at the back and um, this is the church in Rome several months before the trip I wrote by email to make sure they'd be meeting that night I checked up and made sure we found a faithful congregation as best as I could determine I had a favorite college professor Earl Edwards who spent a number of years uh, preaching in Rome or uh, in Italy rather and thought he would kind of have a connection and he did so we made the connection and when I emailed the church there, they gave my name to one of their members who spoke English, which is kind of valuable. And she is a woman from South Africa. She's the one standing next to Tabitha with the black long sleeve, the uh, light colored pants there in the front row. And she told me exactly what to say to the bus driver so we could get off at the right stop. So we're going to take a bus, get the full effect. And she's like, say these words. <laughs> and... When he tells you to bail, you bail, and uh, that's what we did, and then walked a little more. But uh, they had a song service that night, since it was kind of a, a holiday, not a lot of people there. And uh, she would lean over and kind of whisper the song number to us, so we could do the best we could to follow along. Just kind of sitting in a circle in folding chairs around this back room here, and uh, toward the end there was a discussion going on that I obviously didn't understand any of. And after that she leaned over and said, um, they'd like to know whether you'd be willing to lead a song. And then they were all looking at me, and I was uh, pretty terrified. Had no idea what's going on here, but can you lead a song? So I'm like, okay, let's sing Amazing Grace. And so we found Amazing Grace in the book, I think, and uh, I led that song in English from memory. I didn't have it in English in the book there. And so I sang it in English as they sang along in Italian. And it was a memorable experience, but she got one of the men to give us a ride back to the hotel, um, I would say we had a great one-sided conversation the whole way back to the hotel, <laughs> and I understood none of it. This guy was just talking full speed ahead in Italian the whole way, and we were just smiling and nodding, and here it is, 9, 9.30 at night, uh, getting back to the hotel there. Uh, but it was a great in uh, experience. In fact, being with Christians in Rome, I think, would probably be a, a highlight of our entire two weeks that we spent over there in Europe. And again, I share this because Paul is now in the city of Rome and he's fellowshipping with the Christians who are there. And I'm thankful for that experience. But again, this brings us to a great place to pause. Hopefully we can wrap it up next week. Uh, finish the book of Acts by looking at what Paul does in Rome over the next two years of his life. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you can be present for worship on Sunday at 9 or 11 and then plan on being there for class in between at 10. And let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us this time to study together tonight. We are thankful for your providential care for the Apostle Paul and for Luke and for Aristarchus. We're thankful for the opportunities that you have provided even in a shipwreck, you found a way to give Paul many more opportunities to tell the world about your son in far-off places. 
We know that you continue to provide opportunities to explain the gospel even today. And so we ask for wisdom to see those opportunities, and we ask for courage to speak up. We ask that you will be with our friends and our loved ones and members of the congregation who are struggling with their health tonight. From COVID to cancer, you know what we're going through. You are a God who sees. You are a God who cares. You are a God who heals. In these strange and uncertain times, we're thankful for the technology that keeps us connected. We're thankful for the care and the food you continue to provide. And we're thankful that in many cases, what we need can be delivered right to our homes. Thank you, Father, for taking care of us so well. Tonight, we ask for healing. We ask for peace. We ask for opportunities to do good. And we ask for the comfort that only you can provide. In Jesus we pray. Amen.